Um, you know, from time to time at Rock Valley Bible Church, I, I like to begin my messages with a, a short little quiz. Uh, so this is sort of sort of fun, um, sort of light. My my theme this morning is corporate mascots. Okay, this is the time for the Browns to shine. Uh, I'm I'm sure, but. Uh, I want to show you a mascot, and um, you can just shout out the name of the company, and if you know the name of the mascot, that's like bonus, bonus points for you, okay? So we're going to start with the easy one. This is just for the kids, all right? Um, I, I, want, I want even the name of the mascot and the company. So here we go. Ronald McDonald, right? Okay, I, I heard that. That's, that's, that's easy, okay? Now adults, you can join in. This is still... This is still pretty easy. Okay, who's this? Mr. Peanut, Mr. Peanut from what? Peanut. Planters Peanuts. You got it right. All right, we're, we're going along. All right, how about, how about this one? Charlie. Charlie. Sorry, Charlie. For who? For what company? Starkiss. You can see, you see Charlie's got his name there. Can you see his name? Yep. He got his name just right up there. All right, um, we're, we're getting more difficult. This one's, this one's we'll see. Pillsbury Doughboy for what company? Pillsbury. However, what's Pillsbury Dough name? What's his name? That's a good guess. Harold, like the guy with the crayon. Not it. No, it's not Bob. That's a good guess. His name is Poppin' Fresh. I didn't think you know that. You learn something new every day here at Rock Valley Bible Church. You never know. Okay, how about this one? This is a little tougher. Hawaiian Punch. Do you know what this guy's name is? Punchy is his name. <laughs> All right, how about this one? Ray, Ray. What is it? Did I hear it? Linux. Yes. Do you guys know what the name of the penguin is? Tux, Tux the penguin, is uh, is is his name. All right, here's another one. Not quite close. Not Mr. Clean, Mr. See, I tried to start off easy, and then we're getting we're getting harder. Okay. This is Mr. Muscle Drano. Mr. Clean was close. All right. How about this one? Yeah, do you know what the name do you know what the name of this guy is? Jack. This is Jack from Jack and the Okay, and so here's what I want to talk about. All that all that to get to this. This is like super easy. This is um the Energizer Bunny. Do you know his name? He's the Energizer Bunny. That's his name. All right. So so there it is. But this is the one I want you to think about this morning because this is the one that, if anything epitomizes the Apostle Paul, it is here, the Energizer Bunny. Uh, as advertisers say, what does, what does the Energizer Bunny do? He keeps going and going and going and going and going. He just kind of endures endlessly just has immense stamina, and that's like the Apostle Paul. He keeps going and going and going and going. And, and that's what we see here in the missionary journeys of Paul. He just keeps pressing on and going and going. We've seen, been looking at the missionary journeys of Paul in the last recent months, and, and uh, he went out on his first missionary journey, and, and really nothing could stop him. Nothing could get him down. When he was persecuted for preaching Jesus, he simply went on. And he continued preaching in the next town, even when, catch this, violently attacked, dragged out of the city, stoned and left for dead, he arose and continued on his preaching tour. When Paul returned home from his first missionary journey, he, he went to Jerusalem to deal with the doctrinal uh, issue, the crisis that had, had arisen because of the question of circumcision. Then after a time, he initiated a second missionary journey. He said that, that first time was so fun, right? Getting persecuted and ridiculed and reviled and beaten and stoned. He says, let's do that again. Let's see how the brothers are in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord. He just wanted to see how they were getting on and, and nothing really could stop him. And in recent weeks, we've been tracking Paul and his 
various companions on his second missionary journey. This has taken him, by the way, a thousand miles from home. It's what we reach today when he, he reaches Corinth, like the furthest part that, that he ever went from Antioch. And um, we're going to be looking in, um, in, in Acts chapter 18 about his time at Antioch, which records when, when Paul went into Corinth, rather. Uh, there you can see Corinth on the map. It's over there. It's on the, the western side. Um, the edge of the map, but his second missionary journey began some months prior, a thousand miles away in Antioch on the eastern edge of the map, right? That great church of Antioch sent Paul and Silas out on their mission to strengthen churches and to visit them that Paul had planted on his first missionary journey. And so he went up north into the region of southern Galatia into cities like Derby and Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. Along the way, he picked up Timothy, a young disciple with a good reputation among the brothers. He he continued his westward expansion to Troas, a city on the Aegean Sea, and receiving the Macedonia call, he went over to Macedonia and preached the gospel to Philippi and preached to Thessalonica and Berea. And after preaching in Berea, he, he left Silas and Timothy in that region when he headed, south, he headed south alone into the region of Achaia, where he landed in Athens. And while in Athens, he was provoked by all the idolatry that was around him and and preached Jesus and the resurrection to those in Athens. And, and some mocked him, right, thinking that what he was believing in was such strange ideas. Some were lukewarm and undecided, and, but some believed the, his words and, and followed after Jesus. And that's where Acts 17 ends, and, and all we can do is assume that a church started in Athens, though we don't have record specifically of it. But those few who did believe probably formed a church. But Paul continued on. He continued on to Corinth. And when he was in Corinth, he received a message from the Lord. Uh, Acts chapter 18 and verse 9, the, the message was this, go on speaking. That's the title of my message this morning. It's the imagery that came to mind was the Energizer Bunny who just kept going and going. And he told Paul, you go on speaking. It's the heart of my application this morning to all of us. So just go on speaking. Keep on. Be like the Energizer Bunny and just keep going. You know, throughout the book of Acts, um, Jesus is calling us to be His witnesses. We read in Acts chapter 1, verse 8 of Jesus saying, you will be my witnesses to the disciples. And the story of the book of Acts is really that, is, is the, the disciples being witnesses for Jesus telling others what they had seen and heard in his life and ministry, constantly talking about his, his life and his death and his burial and his resurrection, ascension, and exaltation. And if we see the Holy Spirit through the power of the Holy Spirit, right, the, the church exploded. It went from a few, few hundred or so followers of Jesus to a movement, as we will see even today, a thousand miles away, all because the apostles were simply opening their mouths, telling others of Jesus and being his witness, that's the call of the book of Acts, right? To be my witnesses, right? From, from the empty tomb <clears throat> into the village, clear off into the modern day cities. That's always been the call of every believer in Jesus. And the push of our text this morning is simply this, is just keep on. Don't stop, right? Keep going. Go on speaking, right? Be like the Energizer buddy, right? Never stop speaking. Never stop praying, for people to whom you are, are speaking to. Now, I love the story of, of George Mueller, who he was like the Energizer Bunny as well. He just kept going and going and going. He was converted in 1825 at the age of 20. And um, here he is, a, a picture of him. And uh, when he was 39, he had five friends for which he began to pray. Maybe you've heard this story before. And listen to what he wrote in his diary. He said, in November of 1844, I began to pray for the conversion of five individuals. Now, we don't know whether these were his friends or his, his associates, or we don't know who this was, or family members maybe, workers, I don't know. He says, I prayed every day without a single intermission, whether sick or in health, on land or in sea, whether the pressure of my engagements, whatever the pressure of my engagements might be, 18 months elapsed between before the first of the five were converted. And I thanked God and I, I prayed on for the others. Five years elapsed and then the second was converted and I thanked God for the second and then prayed on for the other three. 
Day by day, I continued to pray for them. And six years passed before the third was converted. And I thanked God for the three and went on praying for the other two. And the time is writing in 1844, um, where the time is writing, whenever that was, he says, these two remain unconverted. And then 36 years later, he wrote that the other two were still not converted. He wrote, but I hope in God, I pray on and look for the answer. They're not converted yet, but they will be. Such was the confidence of George Mueller. He'd seen so many answers to prayer. And Mueller prayed for these men right up to his death in uh, 1898, 52 years. He prayed that these friends might be saved. It was only after he died that it was that these final two men were converted to Christ. But that's such a commitment that, that our text is really calling us to today is to continue to be my witnesses. Not just today or tomorrow, not just next week or next month, not just next year, but for all of our lives. Go on speaking. That's what Paul did in Corinth. So let's read our text. Acts chapter 18, 1 through 17. We read this. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And then he found a Jew named Aquila. In fact, let, let's stop here. Verse 1, right? After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. We've we got to stop there because there's so much here, right? Paul left Athens alone. He left Silas and, and Timothy and Berea to continue the ministry uh, in, in the city of Berea and in Thessalonica, and that's why you're exactly right, Gary, like Thessalonica, Thessalonians was written right in this passage. We see that right in verse 5 when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia. Paul heard about Thessalonica, wrote for Thessalonians, and sent it back to them. But he, at this time, he was in Corinth all alone. Um, now, we know a lot about Corinth, by the way. We, we know a lot about the church in Corinth. In fact, we probably know more about the church in Corinth than we do any other church in all the Bible, simply because here we see how the church started, but plus, Paul wrote two big letters, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, to the church in Corinth. And I, I measured it up, I counted the pages, and I calculated it. Uh, more than 8% of the New Testament is committed to the church at Corinth. And that, that's a lot when you realize all the Gospels, right, that's not dealing with Corinth, that's not dealing with any of the churches at all. First and Second Corinthians are, are, the, are that large. It's only fitting as Corinth is a key city in the ancient world. In fact, it was Corinth and not Athens that was the capital city of Achaia. And if Athens was known for being the intellectual hub of the ancient world, Corinth was known for being the commercial hub of the ancient world. Geographically, it's on an ith ismuth. I can't say that word very well. It's, how about you say that word? Ismuth, right? Do you know in... in, in um, in Greek, that means neck, right? This, this tiny little portion of land that, that goes out to another portion of land. You can see it right even there on the map, just right at Corinth. There's that, that little isthmus right there. Um, stretch of land between the Gulf of Corinth to the west and the Saronic Gulf to the east. Here's, in fact, a modern-day aerial photograph of that land. It's only four miles across. Um, in 1893, construction of the Corinth Canal was completed. And so now ships can uh, just go right in between them. At the time of Paul, of course, that, that was not the case. But on either side, uh, they had port cities. And if you know anything about port cities, you know they're hubs for immorality. It's where sailors can, can come and go. And they came and get, went from both the east and from the west. So this was like a double whammy. This was like Las Vegas and Los Angeles all like put together, like just a the, the sexual immorality there was immense. In fact, to Corinthize, um, to Corinthianize was to engage in sexual immorality. Like such was the debauchery of this place. And to this wickedness, right, Paul writes those in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And, and in 1 Corinthians, right, there was just sexual immorality in the church and how, how the church tolerated and boasted of it. It was not good. And furthermore, right, you think about this church in Corinth. It was hardly a pristine church. They were suing one another. <clears throat> they were looking to celebrity pastors for their boast and joy. Some looked to Paul, some to Apollos, bragging about their wisdom and their teaching abilities. Paul said this, you are of the flesh if you're doing that. They, they took themselves to court. They, they were rude and unloving and boastful. 
Um, in 2 Corinthians, they're dealing with the church splits and schisms, even rejecting the Apostle Paul, right? Preferring the, those with flash rather than the Apostle Paul who was just meek and faithful and, and labored and pressed on. The church in Corinth is so much like the church in America, and I, I look forward to the day when we go through 1 2 Corinthians, and almost even called First and Second Americans is really what it is. But I digress. Paul enters Corinth alone, and here we go, verse 2. This is, this is who he meets. He says this. He says, He found a Jew named Aquila, or Aquila, or however you say that in English, it's Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of of the synagogue believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians heard Paul, hearing Paul believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, he says, do not be afraid, but go on speaking, right? You catch it there? Go on speaking and do not be silent for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made an attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, See to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. My first point this morning, go on speaking, is this. Go on speaking on weekends. So what Paul was doing when he first came to Corinth, and in verse 4, we read this, that he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, the Sabbath is Saturday. Uh, it's, a, it's a day the Jews met for worship in, in the ancient world. It's a religious day. It's the most strategic day for Paul to come and bring the gospel to preach to others. And, and every Sabbath found him in the synagogues. He was speaking to those who had assembled, both Jews and Greeks, and trying, as it says here, to persuade them. He's trying to persuade them to believe in Jesus. And being in and around the synagogue, certainly he was talking about the Scriptures and how Jesus was the fulfillment of the Scriptures and how Jesus was the Christ, how He suffered according to the prophecy just like the Messiah would do. And, and He did this for our sins. And this was His message. We read later in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. And then He was buried, and then He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then He appeared to many people alive, even over 500 of them at one time. That's what I'm proclaiming to you. And we know in 1 Corinthians 2.2 2, that this was the only message He spoke to those in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This is His message. Christ crucified for our sins. Jesus is the Messiah who died for our sins in accordance with all that the Scripture teaches us. He did this on weekends, every Sabbath. You say, you say, well, why did Paul just do this on the Sabbath? Well, he was a working man, is why. He didn't have the time and capacity to preach any more than, than just on the Sabbath. And, and we find in verses 2 and 3 how he was employed. He says, I found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, being recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded them to and all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them, and because they were the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. 
Paul is employed as a tent maker. That was his trade. Um, the disciples were fishermen, and Jesus was a carpenter, and Paul was a, a tent maker. He made tents, or more broadly, he, he dealt with, with leather, like, like all things leather, shade, awnings, banners, whatever. He, he just worked with the, the leather, and he linked up with two Jews, uh, Aquila and Priscilla, who were also tent makers. And this married couple, by the way, will play a prominent role in Corinth, and uh, even in the book of Acts, we will see that uh, soon. But verse 2, we read that they were exiled from Rome by a decree of Claudius. And if you go into extra biblical literature, right, it's one of those instances in Acts that gives us a timestamp about when these things take place. In AD 49, um, there was a decree from Claudius that he expelled the Jews because they were continually rioting at the instigation of Crestus. <clears throat> Many historians think that Crestus is really a, a wrong way to say Christ. Because there was this problem, there was riots that the, the Jews were having in the city of Rome, probably with the Christians battling back and forth. Nothing's new, right? Because uh, as Paul, as he went in and preached the gospel, then these Jews rioted and there was stirring of a problem that Claudius thought it was Christus. He didn't even know whether this is a living person. or They didn't know that this was Christos, the Messiah. And so he said to solve the problems and bring peace in our city, we're just going to expel the Jews. You Jews, get out of here. And that solved the problem because they weren't like fighting anymore with the, the Christians for the sake of peace. It took place in A.D. 49. So everything here took place after that, probably shortly after that. So we're talking A.D. 50, A.D. 51, somewhere around there, Paul is, is here. And so, by the way, so all this we've been going through the book of Acts, it just kind of seems bang, 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 bang. But we're talking about from the resurrection of Jesus, A.D. 30, A.D. 33, whatever, we're talking 17 years, almost 20 years of all this taking place in the history of the book of Acts. Anyway, Paul linked up with Priscilla and Aquila and made tents with them during the week, but during the weekends he was in the synagogues. And I hope that, that finds some encouragement with you. There's much energy and zeal and passion Paul had. He couldn't be in the synagogue every day. He had to work for a living, much like many of you in that same situation. You, you can't be out every day. You can't be out speaking to other people in a, in a public way, right? going someplace with the intention that I'm going to go and speak with others about Jesus. You need to work. You need to provide for your family, whether it's in the workplace or whether it's in the home or whatever you do. you got kids, right? You're, just, you, you're busy. We have lives so we need to support. We can't be out speaking to everybody all the time. God understands. But notice there that Paul was intentional, and maybe that's something for you, right? Paul went to a place that was strategic for the gospel. Do you have a strategic place for the gospel where, where you said, you know what, in the midst of my working, I'm working whatever, five days a week, six days a week, whatever, and, and this is where I go with the gospel, some sort of group. Whether it's serving in your school, right, the, the PTO might, might be a great place, or whether it's some, some club that you go to, or whether it's some activity, whether it's your children, what, some, do you have a place? That's what Paul did. On the weekends, he had a strategic place, and for you it might be Tuesday night, for you it might be Wednesday night, for you it might be Saturday mornings, right? Some bike club maybe you're, you're biking, or maybe some quilting club that you're going and you're going to have some conversations about that. Just something that you like to do, are you intentional, that on your weekend, quote-unquote, your intention of Paul was. But in verse 5, things change. We read, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the Word, testifying the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And, and I mentioned earlier that this is right when 1 Thessalonians was written. If, if you, you don't need to turn there, I'll just read it for you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us so kindly and long to see us we long to see you. For this reason, all our distress and our affliction, we've been comforted about you through your faith. For we really live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we render to God for you? For all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God as we pray constantly earnestly, night and day, that we may see you face to face and supply what's lacking in your faith. So he just kept the news back. And right here, when Paul and si when Timothy, Timothy and Silas come back, Paul pens 1 Thessalonians. It's, it's wonderful, right? This is the background of how all these letters, the um, 
of the Apostle Paul come fit together. But anyway, when, when Silas and Timothy come from Macedonia, we read in verse 5 that they picked up Paul's financial support. So Paul was free to preach every day, all week long, because he was one who was freed up for that. That's what Silas and Timothy enabled Paul to do. Um, you, you think about it, he, he, wasn't, he, was, he was sort of like a pastor, but he was more like an evangelist. I mean, this was Paul. Paul was a missionary. He was an evangelist. At this point, he didn't have a church. He was just out every day talking with people, being fully occupied with the Word, able to speak all week long. And now it's interesting that it was important for Paul not to take an income from those in Corinth. He would later say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he'd speak about how he could have received money from the Corinthians, right? Those who proclaim the gospel get their living by the gospel, he said. But Paul chose not to take any money from them, lest he might be accused that the gospel didn't come freely to them. In fact, Paul says, I robbed other churches who supported me so the gospel might come freely to you. And, and, and really, he did that because the gospel is free. It, it costs nothing to be made right with God. Uh, we don't need to give to the church. We don't need to give to the preacher. We don't need to pray these prayers. We don't need to do religious deeds. We don't need to light candles or chant specific words or sing specific songs. We simply need to come to God with open arms pleading, just saying, God, be merciful to me. And as Psalm 86, 5 says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. God abounds in steadfast love to all who call upon him. It's free. And why the world doesn't accept that, I, I'm not exactly sure. But the important part, Paul says, is that when I came to you, I, I didn't charge a cost. I wasn't charging, I wasn't trying to make any sorts of money. No, I came to you simply speaking about the freeness of Christ, that in a steadfast love he'll forgive all of your iniquity. It's the point of the message, the Messiah that he, he proclaimed. Now, the verse 5 tells about his message. He was testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And we've seen this before in Acts 17, verse 3. This is the message he, he preached in Thessalonica. Paul's explaining and proving that it's necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ, he said. So I'm just telling you about the Christ, and Jesus then matches right up with that. And that was his constant message, the, the message of the gospel. Is that the Messiah was told he's going to suffer and die and rise from the dead. And Jesus suffered and died and rise from the dead, suffering for our sins, raising from the dead to conquer death for us. And that's what we need to speak to others all week long. Now, it, it, it seems here as if preaching every day right, stirred up some persecution. If you look at verse 6, we see some persecution coming. And when they opposed and reviled Paul, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. The persecution was a regular occurrence for Paul. He faced opposition, oftentimes often reviled. You name a city where Paul went, and he was reviled. Uh, and you think about his first missionary journey when he went to Pisidian Antioch. Was he reviled and persecuted there? Check. Acts 13, verse 50, 45, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Eventually, they drove him out of their district. What about Iconium? Was he persecuted there? Check. Acts 14.5, an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews or the rulers to mistreat them and to stone Paul. So he went to Lystra. What about Lystra? Was there persecution in Lystra? Check. He got it right. Check. Jews came from Antioch, Acts 14.19. And Iconium, having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul, dragged him out of the city, supposing he was dead. Then he went back home. Second missionary journey. He's going, traveling along. First place he really lands is Philippi. Persecution of Philippi? Check, right? Remember, he was thrown in prison. The, the mob, the crowds were attacking him, tearing garments off of the, the magistrates, tearing garments off of them in, in distress, and they'd inflicted many blows upon them, threw them in prison. That's where he was in with the Philippian jailer. What about Thessalonica? Was he persecuted in Thessalonica? Yes. Check. He got it right. Um, Acts 17, 5, the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob 
<clears throat> set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. Everywhere they went. And here was in, Paul was in Corinth, right? Same thing. Verse 6, when they opposed and reviled him. And, and so Paul, what he did, he took off his garments. I, I thought this morning about taking off my shirt, right? Taking off my shirt. It probably made a, but I, I don't. <laughs> You're welcome, Yvonne. <clears throat> but picture it in your mind. <clears throat> Ripping my shirt off. And, and then what he did, he went, right? He shook the dust off his garments, and so he didn't even want the dust from the Jews upon him. Now, this was similar to practice of many Jews. Upon leaving Gentile lands, they would shake the dust off their, their feet, saying that the Gentile ground, I don't even want Gentile dirt on me. And so here was Paul signaling to the Jews that he viewed them as dirty Gentiles, didn't want any of their dust. Their dust wasn't even good enough for them. But amidst the persecution, many came to faith. Look at verse 7. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with the entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. This is revival. Neighbors right next door to the synagogue were coming to faith. I mean, that, that's like, like our, our church building, right? The, the neighbors right next door. And uh, the, the old people who used, used to live there moved out. The gospel was shared with them. They didn't come to faith. And, and across the way, even the gospel has clearly been shared to them, and they didn't come to faith. But here, the gospel was shared with them, and Titius, Justice, came to faith. And, and verse 8, 8 is astonishing. Crispus the ruler of the synagogue. This is the one steeped in the Scripture. The Old Testament, right? The, the one who would lead the charge against Paul, typically, he bowed the knee and he believed in the Lord. Together, his entire household believed. Everyone in his house believed. And many of the Corinthians believed, verse 8, when they heard Paul. And many of those in Corinth, then it says, were baptized. And I simply point out again, this is biblical baptism. People believe and then they're baptized. It's not the other way around. You're not baptized and then believe. It's always belief and then baptized. Have you been baptized since you've believed? I hope this summer to have a baptism ceremony for those who haven't yet professed their faith in baptism as Jesus commands us. Anyway, there's a great revival in Corinth in the midst of persecution. But God often does that in the midst of persecution, right? He grows the church in persecution. See, never fear when opposition comes upon the church because God will always use that to further his kingdom. What Satan will try to crush and destroy and smash only spreads further out from under the, underneath him. And, and notice how it came. It came when Paul was speaking all day long to those in Corinth. This evangelist being faithful, and, and I know, God knows, right? The first point on weekends, God knows that we can't be doing that all of us can't be doing that. But Paul was, because he kept on going and going and going like the Energizer Bunny. Now, normally in the course of Paul's ministry, right, you ask Paul, how long are you going to stay in this city? Paul would normally say, well, when the persecution comes and they drive me out of the city, I'm no longer welcome. I'm going to go. And so I think that Paul was ready to flee that place. Um, but then he received a vision in the night, and it changed his plan. And that vision compelled him to stay in Corinth. And uh, he stayed. He went on speaking, trusting God's protection. And that's my third point, verses 9 through 17. Let's look first at verse 9. And this is so rich. He says, The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, He says, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. And really, this is where I get the title of my message this morning, right? Go on speaking. It's what he says, don't be afraid. Go on speaking and do not be silent. It's our application really pushing this morning. Go on speaking. And, and now I love the other phrases surrounding this command. On the one hand, it says, do not be afraid. Go on speaking, do not be silent, right? Two negatives and then a positive, right? Don't be afraid, don't be silent, keep on speaking. And the fact is, by the way, Paul was fearful when he 
spoke to those in Corinth. We know that because he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 and 3, he says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, 1 Corinthians 2, 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and trembling. Isn't that helpful? Here's the great mighty apostle Paul, right? The bold one, the one who's ready to be stoned and ready to, ready to die for Jesus. And yet when he was going to Corinth, he, he was fearful. And he was trembling. If Paul was afraid of speaking with others, if Paul was trembling before others, I think it's okay for me to be fearful when speaking to others about spiritual things. I think it's okay for you to be fearful, have some trepidation. I remember when Eric Lettner uh, spoke from this pulpit, whatever, three months ago. He, he, he shared the gospel for 30 years in campus ministry. He says he still gets scared. He still his heart palpitates when he's speaking with others. If Paul was fearful, we can be fearful too. But it didn't stop him from speaking because he did. And Paul, further, if Paul had to be exhorted not to be silent, to, to clam up when the persecution came, it, it's for us, it's okay for us to have those feelings as well where we just think, you know what, it'd be just a lot easier if I just don't say anything. But you know what, when God says, tugs on your heart, says you should say something, I just encourage you to speak. Don't clam up. Don't be silent. Yet the command comes, amidst your fear, amidst your desire to stay quiet, keep on speaking. Now to these things God gives a promise. Look at verse 10, here's the promise, for I am with you. That echoes the words of Jesus in the Great Commission. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am, help me, with you always even to the end of the age. So it's interesting here. This is a, a command that, that God gave Paul. All these things apply to us. Don't be afraid. Go on speaking. Don't be silent. For I am with you. That promise is for you as well. This is the promise that came to the disciples. This is the promise without. Don't ever think that your witnessing of Jesus, your witnessing for Jesus is a solo job. Jesus is always there. He's there to, to help you and encourage you, strengthen you. In fact, Paul knew this super well. All right, when, when he wrote again to the Corinthians, telling them his own labors, he was quick to tell the Corinthians about God's working in his life. He said in 1 Corinthians 15.10, he said, By the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. He says, all my boldness, all my speaking, all my preaching, all my learning, all my traveling, all my, it's all the grace of God with me. And then he says, on the contrary, he says, I worked harder than all of the other apostles. He worked harder than Peter. He worked harder than James. He worked harder than John. He worked harder than all of them. Then he says this, though not I, but the grace of God that is with me. And that's the secret to any Christian obedience. That's the secret to any Christian living. It's that, it's that, yes, we need to work hard, but we realize that we work hard, but it's not us. It's the grace of God that works with me, through me. Grace is the, the power of that. And it's the only way you're going to go on speaking is if, if the grace of Christ is, is with you. It's if God is with you, there's the promise of verse 10. It's the importance, by the way, of prayer in witnessing, in evangelism, is really to, to pray and say, God, use me, work in me, strengthen me. Well, we see another promise in verse 10, and no one will attack you to harm you. Now, this problem hasn't come to you personally yet. You know what? I think this is applicable to every single one of us sitting here today. I think it's quite true for you. If you go on speaking about Jesus, nobody will attack you to harm you. I think that's true for us. Now, for those in other lands, this might not be true. But for us in America, in 2022, I, I think it's pretty true. All right? In fact, I would be thrilled if it was not true. If you went and you preached the gospel to someone and they punched you out, I'd be like, okay, well, I guess maybe this promise didn't apply to you. But other than that, I think for the most part, this promise applies to us. Now, sure, right, if you speak about Jesus, you may face some ridicule or loss of reputation. 
Right? There may be some financial consequences to that. Maybe a boss isn't going to like you. Right? The, the, the raise may not be coming or there might be some difficulty at work. But I just say in our day and age, this promise might as well come to you. No one's going to attack you to harm you. So don't fear. Don't be silent. No one's going to hurt you. I'm with you. And then the whole reason why, Paul made these, why God made these promises, and this is the whole gem of the text, Verse 10, very end. I have many in the city who are my people. In other words, Paul, I have many people in the city chosen from the foundation of the world. They're my people, but they haven't yet heard the gospel and they haven't yet believed. But if you'll just take that gospel and bring it to them, they will believe and I will bring them into my kingdom. Because they are my people. I love what John Stott says about this. He says, The expression is reminiscent of the Good Shepherd statement that Jesus said, I have other sheep which are not of the sheep pen. That is the Gentiles. So he's, he's talking to the Jewish people. He says, But I, there's other, there are these Gentiles out, Gentiles out here. They are my sheep. They're just not of my pen yet. They had not yet believed in him, but they would do so. Because already, according to his purpose, they belong to him. And he says, this conviction is the greatest of all encouragements to an evangelist. And I just say that is absolutely true. Indeed, this is the hope of every evangelist, is that God has many people in that city. So wherever you go, wherever you speak, this is your hope. That God has many people who you are speaking with. Because, quite frankly, with the gospel, the world views it as foolishness. What we have, we're not going to persuade people in at all unless God works to change a heart. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he was describing about what God does in terms of building a church. And he says this, he says to those in Corinth, he says, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring nothing, to bring to nothing things that are. Here it is. That no human being might boast in the presence of God. You can't boast to say, oh, I was so smart enough to receive the gospel, right? I was so smart enough to figure, out, figure it out. Or even, even the preacher, why, I was so winsome and, and tactful, and, and I had the ability to be able to, to speak with insight and tact and strategy and said exactly what needed to be said. No one can boast about that before the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1.30, and because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. The New American Standard says is by his doing you are in Christ Jesus. It's it's God's doing that stirs the heart then to believe. It's because of him you're in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. So that as is written, let the one who boasts boasts in the Lord. And, and see that that's our hope, is that God is people, and that we through our words as, as stammering or as as as, as a sweaty palms, as a word comes across, or as scared as it comes across from us, or as weak as it comes, or as inadequate, God still works. He chooses the weak. And that's our hope. That, that's the hope of anybody who, who goes on speaking, is that, that God has many people in this city that might sustain Paul, might sustain you to go, to continue to speak, just hoping, right, as, as I play pool on Monday nights, I'm just praying that God has some people there. That as I speak, that word is going to eventually filter into the hearts and lives of some people there where I go on my weekend, if you will. And Paul said this. Right? Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1-5 through 5, about when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the, the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And, and there's the hope. It's not that we're coming with this great wise message that people eventually come and believe. He says, I'd show nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, laser focused on the gospel message that Christ and Him crucified is what you need to hear. And then he says this. He says, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, like I've read. He said, and my speech and my message 
were not in plausible words of wisdom. He says they didn't come across so wise. He says, but they were in demonstration of the Spirit and power. Here it is, why, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 2, 5, so that your faith not, might not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. See, God has people in this city so that we come and we bring this weak and inadequate, foolish-sounding message and people believe so that all glory goes to God. We can't boast of anything that we have. And that was Paul's perspective of, of going to Corinth. And in fact, that's why he stayed. If you look in verse 11, he stayed for 18 months. Verse 11, he stayed a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. He was bringing the gospel to God's people for 18 months, searching out for those people where God's people hadn't heard the gospel yet. And they came and God started this church in Corinth, which was, was just tremendous. But God's working there in that sinful town. There's lots, lots of sanctification work had to be done in Corinth for sure. But God did a work there. And finally, we read 12 through 17. We're going to zip through these fairly quickly, but it just speaks about the example of God's protection upon, upon Paul. It says, but when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a unified attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal. And at this point, you say, well, the promise is that no one's going to attack you to harm you. And here they attacked him, but they didn't harm him. That was the good news. These people made an attack on him, and, and, and they brought him before this, this secular um, the secular tribunal. And they said, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Because, remember, Jesus, he's coming in and he's saying Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. He's the Messiah. And they're saying, no, Jesus wasn't the Messiah. That's in contradiction to the law. You're worshiping this man. He was the God-man. You can't do that. So this dispute. Verse 14, and Paul was about to open his mouth, about to defend himself, and God says, no need, no need to defend yourself. I'm going to protect you during your, your time of persecution because I promise you, no one's going to attack you to harm you because I got this. And so what happens is this. He stirred in the heart of Gallio. The Lord did, surely. Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. Right? In other words, right, if, if Paul was doing something illegal or there's something wrong according to the law, he said, I would accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, here's a secular man talking about you're complaining about the Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, and you're just quibbling about that. You see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. He says, you guys just, just go at it yourself. And, and I would say in many ways, this is like our society today, is that we have secular judges who often just say, well, the religious dispute, you just, you just go deal with those yourself. And I love verse 17. I think there's a lot of humor here. They all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, is probably the ringleader of this whole persecution. So they, they, they seized him and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Right? Kids, from time to time, you might play the game, I don't see, I don't know what you're talking about. And here was Gallio and Sosthenes just getting pounded and smacked. Right? And they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't see anything. Just paying no attention because it was God's protection upon the life of Saul. No one's going to attack him to harm him. And Paul was, was free. Not, not one piece of hair perished from him. He, he, he didn't have any problems there in Corinth. But yet after 18 months, it was time for him to, to go. Verse 18 says, after this, Paul stayed many days longer. And then he took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila and we'll pick that up next week about his return home near the end of his uh, second missionary journey. But I just want to encourage you all, right? Catch the big, the big picture, right, of, uh, of the, uh, the Paul's command by the Lord to go on speaking. This is the message of Acts. We see that model right here in Corinth, and God did a great work for those in Corinth. So let's pray together. Father, I would pray that you would give us boldness to go on speaking you give us persever yes, the perseverance of George Mueller, played, prayed for decades for people that were in his life. I pray that we would um, trust in you, that you'd protect us and be with us. And, and I pray, God, that you would give our word success. I know that's my most difficult 
thing is, is speaking the word to so many people and seeing so many people um, just ignore it. Just like, okay, that's good for you, God. But I pray, God, that you, even this week, might allow my words, might allow our words to fall on the ears of those who are your people who simply haven't believed yet. The sheep that are not yet of your fold, God, that you would bring them in for the glory of Christ. Not that we can boast of what we have done, God, for we, we can't, God, but that all the boasting might be of you as we simply have followed along your counsel and advice to go on speaking. May we go on speaking for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.